Good morning. morning. Welcome to worship today. It is March the 12th, 2023, and today is the third Sunday in Lent, and the liturgical color for today is purple. We're glad that you came to join us in worship. I trust that you'll notice the announcements that are listed in your bulletin. The flowers today are given to the glory of God by Nancy Hare. Also, our March mission will be Lexington, will be a project to support Lexington County Sheriff's Department. We're providing items for personal care bags for men and women. These bags will be given to the victims of crime and also to homeless people who are, who the department has contact. And information for items that you should consider donating are listed here in the bulletin. Um, the results for the March food drive were tremendous. Uh, we collected the most items that we have ever collected in a single day. And so those items were donated to Wittenberg's food pantry this past Monday. And we appreciate you helping out with that, that project. Tonight, we have an exciting thing going on at the church. Uh, we will be doing an escape room. I don't know if there's one room or how many rooms. Does anybody know? Four rooms. Okay, and it's going to be for the youth. And I think we've we've had went. Miss Wendy said we had over 20 something youth sign up. So that's really good. And that will be the tonight. The twelve, the ten plagues of Egypt. Also, a date in your bulletin to mark your calendars for March 18th at 9 o'clock. Uh, we will be helping with the Batesburg Leesville Spring Clean, and John Neese will be heading that up. So please mark your calendars for March the 18th and sign up before March 16th if you would like to help with that. Are there any more announcements that you have? We do have a church council meeting this coming week, the 16th at 7 p.m. Handbells at 645 and praise band at 7 and the choir at 730. Any other announcements? Okay, great. Would you stand, please? Our first hymn of the morning is 127, God Me, O Thy Great Jehovah.
Thank you. Be seated, please. If our children would come forward. blanket and I'm going to lay this blanket down and Connor told me he would help he's going to lie down on the blanket all right and each of you come over here and get one corner. Don't fall down the steps, please. Come on, Holly. Come get this corner. Holly says, I don't know about this. Yeah, we're good. Okay. All right, so let's pretend that Connor here has broken his leg. And he did fall down the steps. And we need to get him to the doctor. Okay, do you think we could pick him up with this blanket? He's kind of heavy. But if you really needed to, you'd try, right? Okay. All right. So we've all agreed that we would do our best, but it would be really hard. Yes? Okay. So let's say we picked him up and we went all the way down to urgent care which is a pretty good ways, and we get there, and there are so many people in there, we can't even get in the door. And we're going, oh, my gosh, we've got to get Connor in there. What are we going to do? Well, what if we noticed there were some steps going up to the roof, and we thought, okay, here's what we're going to do. we got to get him in there to the doctor. We're going to put a hole in the roof and lower him down in there. Would you all do that? If his life depended on it, yeah, we would. But it would be really, really hard, right? Okay. So, the same thing happened one day when Jesus was alive. There was this man that was paralyzed, and a group of his friends wanted to take him to Jesus so Jesus could heal him. And so they put him on a... a Blank, a cloth like this and they carried him to where Jesus was and there were so many people there they couldn't couldn't get inside and so that's what they did they went up on the roof and they put a hole in the roof and they lowered the man right down to where Jesus was and Jesus was so impressed with how hard these people had worked to bring the man to Jesus, that he healed the man and forgave his sins. Well, fortunately, today, when we need to get somebody to the doctor, we probably don't have to carry them on a blanket with four people. We can call an ambulance, and we've got, you know, stretchers and things like that. But we do have friends that need to come to Jesus, that need to know Jesus. And it's our job to get them to him. Now, we don't need to knock a hole in the roof of the church, but we will have a hard time doing that sometimes. We'll have obstacles, right? Things like, don't tell me what to do, and don't push your religion on me. So we have to be really smart about how we bring our friends to Jesus. 
Can we do that? Yes, we can, okay? And I know you all do a good job of that every day. All right, let's pray. Dear God, thank you for loving us. Help give us the strength and wisdom to bring our friends to Jesus who need you. Amen.
Good morning. Again, our Old Testament lesson is from Exodus chapter 17, verses 1 through 7, which is found on page 64 of your pew Bible. From the wilderness of sin, the whole congregation of the Israelites journeyed by stages, as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. The people quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. Moses said to them, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people complained against Moses and said, why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, what shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord said to Moses, go on ahead and of the people and take go on ahead of the people and take some of the elders of Israel with you. Take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I'll be standing there in front of you on the rock at Oreb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it so that the people may drink. Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He called the place Messiah and Meribah, because the Israelites quarreled and tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? And the New Testament lesson is from Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12, on page 36 in your pew Bible. When he returned to Canaanium, Capernaum, after some days, it was reported that he was at home. So many gathered around that there was no longer room for them, not even in front of the door, and he was speaking the word to them. Then some people came, bringing a paralyzed man carried by four of them. And when they could not bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And after having dug through it, they let down the mat on which the paralytic lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, Why does this fellow speak in this way? It is blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but God alone? At once Jesus perceived in his spirit that they were discussing these questions among themselves, And he said to them, Why do you raise such questions in your heart? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Stand up and take your mat and walk? But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, Stand up, take your mat, and go to your home. And he stood up and immediately took the mat and went out before all of them so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. The word of God for the people of God. How many of you have... um, It is turned on. How many of you have read the story of the man who was lowered down through the roof? You've all heard it. And uh, when I read that, there are all kinds of thoughts that come to my mind about friendship and We've studied this passage, too, in some of our Monday morning Bible studies and taught how to sort of put ourselves in the place of that man that was being lowered through the roof. What was he thinking? Uh, you, know he, you know he's probably thinking, please don't drop me. Please don't drop me. And it, it sounds almost like a Salkahatchee experience to me. I don't know how many of you have been to Salkahatchee, but... 
at Salkahatchee, we do kind of crazy things. It's a good experience for youth to learn how to build houses. I can see Jesus in this picture looking up with, you know, stuff falling on his face, thinking, wow. I mean, I thought I had seen it all. And here, somebody is coming through the roof to get healing. So we, we're tempted to kind of think on the friendship part or what Jesus may have been thinking, but I, wanna, I want us to take a different angle to this, one that kind of struck me this week when I, when I read this story. The man that was on that mat that was being lowered down through the roof, he was looking for healing. Jesus had gone to Capernaum, and Capernaum had different spots in it. It was kind of an area where there were um, some of the finer abodes, some of the finer houses, and a lot of those houses had steps that went up to a patio roof where people could dine, have fine dining, or rest. So the crowd was so large on the inside of that house and even on the outside that they, these four people could not get their friend to Jesus, so they decided, decided to lower him through the roof. But that man was looking for healing. I don't know that he was looking for forgiveness. You would expect, you know, when he was lowered down through the roof for Jesus to say something like, how long have you been paralyzed or what caused this paralysis? But Jesus said something very shocking. He said, son... Your sins are forgiven. Doesn't that seem odd? When you read that, does that seem odd to you? Well, in looking at other passages in the New Testament, I found this week example after example after example of Jesus saying, I have never seen such faith as this. Your sins are forgiven. There was the story of the woman who had an issue of blood. Well, I'll skip her, but let me give you another example. Matthew 8, 10, that's the story of the centurion's son. And you remember he came to Jesus and he said, my son is very sick, I need you to heal him. And he, Jesus said, okay, you know, let's go. And he said, no, you don't have to come into my house. He said, I'm a soldier, a man in charge. And he said, I say to the people underneath me, do this and do that, and they do this and that. You say the word, Jesus, and my son will be healed. And Jesus said to him, I have never seen such faith as this. And he said, go, your son is healed. There's also the story of the Canaanite woman. Her daughter was possessed by a devil, and she came to Jesus, and she fell before him and said, Lord, please help me. And he said, I came to, the law, to, sa to save the lost sheep of Israel. It's, a, it's not right to give, them, give to your daughter what belongs to them. And she said, just let me have the crumbs. Even the crumbs under the table, the dogs are able to eat the crumbs. Let, let me just have some of the crumbs. And he said, woman, you have great faith. Your daughter has been healed, and her daughter was healed. There, there are example after example after example where Jesus comments in the New Testament on a person's faith and their healing. There's a connection between faith and healing. And, you know, faith, healing movements or seminars or things that happen, revivals, that's beyond what I'm talking about today because that can be tr tricky to kind of understand. But there is a connection between faith and healing, and that man lower down had faith. And Jesus said, go, son, your sins are forgiven. 
he could have gotten up from that mat and just went, and that would have been it. But there was something tricky in the mix there in that area where Jesus was preaching that Jesus had to address. And I think a lot of times we get caught off on friendship or, you know, the strength that it had to take. There is something in this passage that is interesting and not not often talked about, and that's the fact that there were pe- there were scribes in that room who thought Jesus was blaspheming, and he knew that they were thinking that. Well, what is blaspheming? Um, that's one of those religious words that we talk we don't talk much about. But there's a definition for blaspheming, and several definitions actually. If you were to say something insulting or critical, or irreverent towards God, that would be called blaspheming. Or if you were showing a lack of reverence for God, that is blaspheming. Or if you claim to be God, that is blaspheming. So the scribes in this, in this story, they knew from Old Testament passages from Samuel and Psalm, and Daniel, 1st King, that only God can forgive sins. They knew that only God could heal. So when Jesus said, son, your sins are forgiven, they immediately think that he's blaspheming because he's claiming to be able to forgive sin, and if he's Forgiving sin, he is also claiming to be God. You follow me? He's claiming his dignity. He's claiming his Godship. And he knew that in saying your sins are forgiven, that there would be problems because in saying your sins are forgiven, he's also claiming to be God. And those scribes, we're probably going nuts inside their head. I can't believe this man is saying this. And Jesus realized that there was a problem in the room and that he needed to address this issue. So he didn't take the easy way out. He, he said to them, which is easier? For me to say, son, your sins are forgiven, or for me to say, son, get up and take your mat and walk. A forgiveness of sins, there's not, not really kind of an outward sign of that, right? I, I mean, you could go to Jesus and confess your sin, and he forgives you of your sin. He's faithful and just to do that. And you could, you could have a feeling that your sins are forgiven, and down the line maybe your behavior and your actions might change but right there there's usually not an immediate sign that goes along with the forgiveness of sin but when Jesus says take your mat with you and go there's gonna be proof there right if the man doesn't get up and walk in this situation that's going to be a sign to the scribes who are in this room that maybe Jesus wasn't who he claimed to be. But when the man picked up his mat and walked, that was proof to them that Jesus was who he said he was and that he could do what he claimed he could do. And he said that he did this healing to prove to them that the Son of Man had the authority to forgive sin on earth. And you can go back and look up Son of Man. That was Jesus' favorite term for himself. Of all the times he referred to himself, a lot of the time, he refers to himself as the Son of Man. And that term is loaded with Old Testament connotations and implications 
it's not just son of man, there's son of man, there's son of God, but son of man is an Old Testament term that you can go and look up what that refers to, but that was his favorite, favorite way of referring to himself. So there is healing and there is this connection with healing and faith that we see over and over and over in the New Testament. In Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Jesus said, Come to me, all of you who are burdened and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. A yoke is like a yoke around a neck. And learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. What is he talking about rest for your soul? Well, he's talking about a Sabbath rest that comes when one's sins are forgiven or when one realizes and understands completely that their sins are forgiven. It's a peace that the Bible talks about a peace that comes with understanding and a wholeness of the soul. See, there's this issue here of this man who is being lowered and he has a physical infirmity. But first of all, Jesus wants to address the soul because as he knows, Sometimes, when the soul is healed, the physicality of the problem is healed as well. And Jesus takes away the sin for all who come to him and ask. There is sin, and there's actual sin that we have in our lives that may be being ugly to somebody, and, you know, we say, I have sinned, I need to ask God. But there's also a condition of sin that we are all in. And Jesus takes away both actual sin and the condition of being in sin. Sin is a tricky thing. And a lot of times people don't want to talk about sin. I had a lady tell me one time in the church, she said, I have never heard sin preached from the pulpit in this church. That was a former appointment. Methodists, we don't like to talk about sin. Sin has implications in our lives because it causes us to have guilt and it also causes shame. And the two of those things are different. Guilt is I have done something wrong and I can ask God to forgive me of my sin. But shame is different. Shame is not I have done something wrong. Shame is I am bad or I am wrong. And friends, for a lot of people in this world, they have walked around with shame all of their lives. Shame often occurs in childhood. And sometimes it's passed from parent to child, this feeling or this implication that you're bad you're not worthy, uh, that you're, you're rejected, you're hopeless. And some people in this world have walked around with shame and guilt from the time they were little. Uh, parents are not only a source of this, but one of the other big sources of this is teaching from the church. That makes me very sad. That made me very sad to learn that some people have paralysis because of things that have happened to them in childhood or things that they are wrongly taught from the pulpit of churches. And Jesus wants to take care of this man, not only his paralysis of his body, but the paralysis that comes 
from being in sin. The ironic thing of this is that if you do research on guilt and shame and look at some of the psychiatry behind it, guilt and shame can actually cause physical paralysis. But more often than that, it causes anxiety, um, it causes depression, it causes all kinds of people who are caught in guilt and shame because of sin to become chronic victims and become trapped in a life of guilt and shame. We often get addicted to our guilt and to our shame. That comes when we talk more about the mistakes that we've made in life than the good things that God has done for us. That comes when we get trapped in this cycle of I've done something wrong, I'm guilty, I'm bad. It comes when we ask God for forgiveness and God forgives us, but we can't forgive ourselves. A whole lot of people in this world are walking around and they, what they need is not a physical doctor or a mental doctor. What they need is a little bit of Jesus. The thing about it is that when we have sin in our lives or there is guilt and shame and we go to God, the Bible tells us that he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. But sometimes we just want to ruminate on the mistakes that we've made over and over and over. I don't know if you've ever done that or, or thought, wow, I wish I could go back and change how I handled that or man, I really made a mistake on that one, and you just can't forgive yourself because you screwed up, and you know you screwed up, and you've asked God to forgive you of your sin, and God has forgiven you of your sin, but you can't stop thinking about or wishing that you had done things differently. Paul talked about it. He said, I do things that I wish I wouldn't do, and I don't do the things that I wish I would do. When we ask God to forgive us of our sins, God takes away those sins and forgives us of those sins. And the funny thing is, the ironic thing is, to ruminate on it and to go back and revisit it over and over and over, that in itself is a sin. Because it shows that one believes that God doesn't really or hasn't really forgiven us of our sins. We walk in this life laden with guilt and shame that God tells us he's taken away. We confess our sins, but we don't really believe that he's forgiven us or that we can forgive ourselves. So I think the takeaway from this and what God would have us to know is that Jesus is the Messiah. He is the one and only Son of God, and that in him we are new creatures. Our lives are gone. If we are Christians, the Bible tells us that our lives are, that we are it's as though we are dead and our lives are now hidden in Jesus Christ and we walk in the fullness of Jesus Christ so that when God sees us, he doesn't see a sinner. He sees someone who fouls up but is forgiven by the blood that our precious Savior poured out for us on the cross of Calvary. Let us pray. God, we know that you are a divine healer, and we know that you alone can forgive us of our sins and our guilt and our shame and restore us to wholeness by the healing of our souls. We know that there are some in this room who have borne the burden of sin and guilt and shame all of our lives, and we struggle, Lord, to find healthy ways to live and wholeness 
but we get wrapped up and we ruminate on our mistakes and wrongdoings and we know that we let you down and that we miss the mark daily. Lord, we, we're sorry for our sins. Forgive us and free us from the shame and guilt that often plagues our minds and paralyzes our lives. We want to walk in your ways and not the ways of the world. Heal us, O Lord, divine healer and author of all creation. We ask this in the name of pre the precious name of Jesus, our Savior and Redeemer. You tell us by his stripes and his death on the cross and his resurrection, we are healed. And we thank you, God, that you have done this and that you are a God of mercy and that you are the true and great physician. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray and we offer this prayer that he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but forgive us. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. At this time, we'd like to invite our, oh well, I'm sorry, I'm off, I'm off a little bit. Would you stand please? Our next song is When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, page 298. The Apostles' Creed is found on page 881 of your hymnal. Let us now unite in this historic confession of our Christian faith. Leesville United Methodist Church, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, 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 Almigh
maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, your only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. time if our ushers and acolytes would make ready we'll take up our morning offering
remain standing, please. Our last hymn of the morning is in The Faith We Sing, page 2108, Oh How He Loves You and Me. peace in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. May he bless you today and always. Amen. <laughs>